Ladies and gentlemen, kids of all ages, it's Thursday night, 7 o'clock mountain. That means it's time for the matriarchy. You can feel free to applause. Tonight we are joined. You don't really have to. I'm just kidding. I don't know who did that, but I that was weird. It definitely wasn't me. You'd be able to see it. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't that. Anyhow, um, but yeah, we've got uh, Paula Ritchie. Uh, I am the metal. Witless and... Um, Jack Irons, Cody of Ironverse Comics. And we are gathering together to talk about how to build a universe. But before we get into that, because that's a heavy topic, let's let's open up with some softballs. How are y'all doing today? Well, last I checked, I'm alive, so it's stellar. <laughs> that's a good uh, measurement. That's a good measurement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are there any projects people are working on at the minute? Oh, too many. Yes. Too many? <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm doing the illustrations for a children's book for Jeremy Lott. And I've also got uh, a novel sequel that I'm working on. The first one hasn't quite come out yet. Mm -hmm. It's in the pipeline. And I also had another one that was a maybe that was uh asha which was a comic about a jungle queen on a hostile alien planet and i thought well i have too many projects already so i'll only start this one if say it gets how many likes 400 and i've got 38. <laughs> i did have 39 but i think one of the guys who liked it got kicked off twitter so oh. that was sad yeah, that's a that sounds amazing though. I'm gonna have to seek that one out because that's a that's a that's amazing. That's like B movie, like black and white painted background awesomeness. I just I want to see that. <laughs> I want to see it too. I was not supposed to be writing this one, but um, Asha is very pushy for uh, not being someone who can speak. <laughs> so. Uh, we made this deal, and if I get enough likes on the picture, then I will take myself on as a client and <laughs> get started on it for real instead of like in a spare time thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hear that. I hear that. I've, I've, I'm always trying to figure out which which little thread to pull, right? Which one is makes the most sense in terms of time. Um, we are just about to wrap up for our patrons. Um, Panic at the Ren Fair is is almost complete on our patreon i'm very excited about that it's our it's the last the most recent story of force of good and evil our our huge web comic epic it's like almost 500 pages of web comics 26 or 27 individual stories that are all part of um the path of these of these young people and um it's been been a real trip on that one um we're almost wrapped with that and um on the main website we're doing two updates a week um, that story is actually being published, but there's more information if you're a patron. You can see the, the closer to the end of the story. And uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, and I just got, I don't want to, I can't say a lot about it, but I just got the okay for a, a collaboration that um, uh, I did the treatment for. Um, and we're going to go into script on it um, that you will probably be talking about in November. So um, it's really exciting project that uh i can't talk about yet <laughs> but it just happened today so i'm all on twitter so fly fox has joined us although his mic is muted so he'll maybe he just doesn't want to be heard yet twitless what have you been up to man oh i've been um trying to motivate myself to keep writing <clears throat> oh that sounds that sounds sad tell us Almost, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, You're amongst friends. Tell us, share with us. <laughs> Mostly, it's been the trying to balance the whole YouTube thing with comics thing, because mm -hmm. it always feels like you know when you want to do comics uh, in today's world, uh, you have to kind of uh, boost yourself on several other platforms, and so you find yourself spreading yourself really thin, mm -hmm. doing things. I mean, YouTube's fine. I don't want to down talk it too much, but it's like my my goal is to do comics, but I feel like I have to do a whole bunch of other things in order to try to do the thing I want to do. So it's you know, it's exhausting. Yeah. That that is kind of a show into itself, man. 
It's like when it comes down to because we do we're like I mean those of us who are, we're, we're self promoters right we're indie people yeah, how to be yeah. your own PR yeah. yeah you gotta do you gotta do marketing you gotta do PR you gotta do HR you gotta do all, all of your tax stuff and all you really want to do is tell stories about people in in, in funny outfits and I think with with any of our genres that we write in or, or draw in I think that qualifies whether it's fantasy or sci fi sure. or superheroes or I you know people in funny outfits so I would say the outfits are funny. We just don't have the courage to wear that stuff every day. I would say the outfits are fun. <laughs> fun outfits. I like that better. We'll drop the knee. Fun outfits. Fair enough. Fair enough. There, there I go. Being judgy, I guess. <laughs> Cody, what are you going up to these days? Oh, just got my jobs back this week, so I've been uh, getting back into that groove and finding the, the new groove that, that is working right now. Uh, but uh, other than that, of course, uh, Jack Irons, Steel Cowboy, issues one through three, they're up on uh, Indiegogo. We've been grinding away at that, and wonderful art's been coming in. I've been tweaking the script to the art as it comes in, and should be about two-thirds done by the end of this week, So, and I guess that's tomorrow, isn't it? So, yeah, that's pretty quick. And uh, we're working on it, and I'm really excited. Uh, came out quality. Uh, well, it's coming out quality. Uh, I'm hoping I found the right balance between what I tried in number one and what I tried in number two. And uh, I'm hoping folks will enjoy what we're doing again so I get to do it one more time afterwards. <laughs> and so on. But, uh, yeah, just, just grinding at it. When is that supposed to be fulfilled in there? That's uh, uh, I set it out for December, which was and still is hopefully uh, uh, about two months later than I actually expect to fulfill. But I uh, last time, I guessed too early, mm -hmm. and uh, this time I'd rather be, uh, be on the wrong side uh, this way than, uh, than the other way. So oh. hopefully uh, December, it's, it's hitting everybody um, at the latest. I, I actually know exactly like that, that pain. <laughs> With, uh, we funded a book last summer. And the yeah, project the we're getting pages. What? So where's, where's the book? I'll, tell I'll, I'll tell you where it is. It's not done. So the, the 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 tempo of pages we were getting in when we came up with our projections, like dropped off suddenly. And um, if you've been following your updates, there were some personal problems our pencil artist had. Um, his father passed away. It was a whole thing, and so we're trying to figure out where we go from here on it. And it it it. I'm as the writer, I'm in something of a limbo because I can't, you know, yeah. I don't want to like crack whips on people going through uh, stuff, but I also, uh, uh, it's my name on the front of the page. So I feel <laughs> extra. Yeah. I've been following I've never, the updates, but uh, I don't know. I'm I've always seen people pester people for where their book is and it seemed fun. So I finally get to do it. Okay. There you go. Fair enough. You, at least you do it live. That's the important. Yeah. So that way everyone knows. Um, but uh, I think that uh, I, 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 that's I'm never doing it that way again. Um, I, we're we're gonna make sure that we have you know at least you know pencils and inks done before we even launch campaigns, um, if not having the whole the whole project wrapped. So I've got a couple of the projects that are in, in various stages, and I'm barely even talking about them because I'm like you know we're gonna I've got I've got a, an ink artist who's also a student. So he, homework has got to come first, and uh, I respect that. <laughs> so um, I have another guy who's a professor, and so homework has to come first. And I respect that, too. <laughs> In his case, though, it's other people's homework. It's different. But, but anyway, so um, Fly, thanks for coming. Thanks for yeah. joining us. Yeah. Uh, how, are you, how have you been, man? Doing all right. You know, yeah. just chilling. I'm alive. You're the second person to say that. That's Am I? a running theme. I'm, I'm, That's I'm, my I'm, general response. I, I was I was unaware that like mortality was such a threat with this group of people. <laughs> I I was, like in this year. It's my favorite. You place. have no idea. <laughs> I feel like I've been callous or somehow careless with this. Yeah. I live taking your mortality for granted is what you're doing. <laughs> that could be. That could be. I'm looking forward to the next world though, so I don't. You know, I'm not too worried about this. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're taking your immortality for granted. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm not taking the next six months for granted. Yeah. Fair enough. The first six about mm -hmm. got me. So 
Um, since we're on here, to, we, we've kind of done the, the thing. Um, let's go ahead and quote, kind of go. So seem like a square. You need yeah. a fun outfit now. <laughs> you happen Bring to have a, back in. I have a sword next to me too, if I need to. Nice. <laughs> if this stream gets too boring, he's just going to be just like that's it. I'm just. Gonna I'm just going to start adding stuff. I've got plenty. Completely in half. I got like tunics around here and stuff too. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Paula, since uh, you joined first, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about um, your universe and what the what are the things that you th were thinking of when you started putting it together. Okay, so for my Soulbound comic. Um, that is, it's a particular world that goes through several different eras and it's kind of like the last stop between reality and oblivion. Um, so everything that's about to go extinct or everything that never quite was at some point in time passes through this realm. So we've got some medieval, we've got some ancient Roman, we've got some cryptids and uh, megafauna and stuff going through one era altogether and then other things that don't really match any era um, coming together. So I was trying to, well, I always hate the idea of like something going entirely extinct and, or a civilization going entirely lost, unless you know it, like really deserved it. But, uh, <laughs> we're all thinking of the Aztecs, I hope. Oh, I was um, thinking of the Persian Empire, but. Oh, well. Um, yeah, every now and then maybe they do. Um, but yeah, I don't want anything to be entirely lost. I want things to have a second chance to do it right. Um, or less egregiously wrong. <laughs> and uh, so the idea of having a second chance on this world is one thing. And then um, I wanted to see how if if time was linear for this place, but things get dropped from this world from different times, onto it how would these various eras interact with each other so that kind of it gives a lot of stuff to play with yeah and yeah. uh yeah i just really want to see how the world grows and changes as it goes on so we're gonna have like a fantasy era and then the genre of the series um after the soulbound series there's going to be another one that uh, goes into like a magic steampunk series where, you know, they achieve you know, that level of technology along their timeline. And you know, it still has like shared historical elements with yes. the, uh, the fantasy stuff. That's fun. Yeah. I like it. I so like it's it. like their legends um, actually happened. Nice. That's actually really a fun thing because I know that with uh, with uh, Ex Dynamos Chaos that uh, Metal does, um, it's it's almost got like all of your 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 favorite things are real. Yeah, <laughs> everything. Everything. Just the, everything. The, the things that you don't believe, they're they're real. <laughs> yeah, most people don't see them, so they just they forget about them. And that, uh, and that's like cryptids and demons and cat girls and all kinds of stuff that everything. Are, Ooh, that cat girls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you should check it out. It's a fun. It's a fun comic. I'm not. I'm not done reading it because I get. Distracted. Well, it's okay because it's on hiatus at the moment because I'm working on a manga in the same world for the Tezuka manga contest. I'm like halfway done, but you're allowed to post it like early as long as you don't do it commercially. So I've been posting them all in the same uh, gallery on the mm. site. It's like the first post up there. People can read it. It's like 27 pages in right now. Cool. Cool. So, um, and that's in your website, which I didn't do anything with anybody's <laughs> links in the description because I'm really lame. Actually, it's because like I started putting the, the thing together last night and I was like, Ugh. dead. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, I don't. 
So I, I'll do that later. Well, aren't you grateful you're alive now with well, the rest of us? <laughs> I was using that metaphorically, but thanks for teasing me about it. <laughs> Keep me humble. So, Cody, yours, um, of, of all of everyone's projects I've read, I think yours is probably the most cosmic, if I can use those terms. Um, what uh, would, go ahead. That's, excuse me. Go ahead. I was going to say, what, what would you say, um, first of all, do you think that's fair? And second of all, what was kind of your um, push? I think I'll, I'll argue against that, that afterwards, but <laughs> you haven't gotten to the cosmic stuff in mind yet. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Anyway, if it was, uh, it's fair enough to say um, what's been released so far. <sighs> Cosmic has a few different definitions to me. So, okay. of course, it includes space and science fiction and the that kind of stuff. But I would consider Doctor Strange cosmic. Uh, Silver Surfer did a great job of walking the line between space and, and cosmic, that, that exploration of, of what's more. Um, and... Uh, I started with, with a character with, with that kind of... Uh, built-in creation jack with 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 uh, a contrast of immortality and being burdened with knowledge of reincarnation at the same time i, I just thought that was interesting and it's a great little hook for infinite stories uh, whatever you want to tell but um at, at the end of the day ironverse comics is 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 there the universe is built to oppose these four pillars of evil, uh, the things that hold up the entire framework of what we're, we're doing, and uh, those are the four horsemen, these, these entities of uh, uh, physical manifestations of negative emotions, actions, uh, existences, um, that perpetuate themselves and seek to devour all of reality and manifest only them as the new reality, to supplant God or whatever you want, however you want to put that forward. And... Um, with that, it gave us a very strong base on how to, you know, we could build anything we want with the with the kind of the Star Trek vibe. Any planet can have any of these manifestations manifest however you'd want to to tell the story you want to tell. Uh, that was my main goal with the world building was to have a solid uh, foundation that's understandable, uh, very kind of simple at its base, but can be opened as wide as as the imagination of the writers and artists who, who want to engage with it. And uh, I, I've been proud so far that we've done pretty good presenting it to, to, to the world, and I hope to, to keep pushing forward with that. Uh, mentioning the Tezuka manga contest, we've got our uh, first manga, Cactus Coyote, up there again. He didn't know he could do two entries, and so he had put his first entry up there, and it got uh, pretty good reception, but then he read a, uh, a newer manga that kind of broke down his, uh, his perspective, and he thought what he had put up was kind of disrespectful. It was not as good as he could do. He should do better for it. And uh, so that's the stage we've been at until you realized, yeah, you can enter two, two submissions. And so we re-entered the old one, which is available on Tapas to read for free if you want to check out Cactus Coyote. Uh, or it's on the Tezuka Mon Manga Contest as well. Uh, you can read it there for free. Uh, but we're also going to enter another revised one uh, just under the line, he's thinking he's got just enough time to to redo uh, the the fifty pages. Uh, but uh, read the script yesterday; it was great. But but the, the the main bit is is for me world building. The is supposed to facilitate the ideas you want to be communicating to to your readers, uh, and and make it enjoyable, flavorful, something unique, something that that helps them uh, feel like they're they're part of the universe or part, part of the 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 the, uh, the movement of, of the I don't want to use the word product uh, the 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 work the uh, the w what's trying to be accomplished and, and communicated right. and uh, that that's always been my goal and so far it's been working so far but uh, we will see <laughs> <laughs> so uh, twitless you've been doing the, uh, the the superhero web comic thing for a number of years um and I know that you, your uh, universe isn't something that is necessarily has terribly consistent rules to it. Um, but you've talked about that you're working on the, the Omega Girl uh, thing on the side. Uh, in what ways are you wanting to, to frame that universe differently than what you've done with Super Schooled? 
All right. So for super schooled, I make it up as I go along and uh, which is, you know, really, really solid word world building. And then for Omega girl, I am going to just steal a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's my strategy. Um, that's okay. it's, so I'm going to go from just total random to theft. There we go. So, that, that, that's really, really honest. Every um, time you open your mouth, I gain more respect for you. Twitless. <laughs> 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 so what are the things that you're hoping to steal? All right. So um, I just love superheroes because I'm my inner child just never grew up. And uh, so I basically just look at all the stuff that I love and I just steal everything that I think is great. And then I play a bunch more video games and I steal a bunch of stuff that I think in video games that are cool. And uh, and then I just, you know, pick, <clears throat> put it on a puree for about 10 minutes. Ta-da. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the thing is, I I think it's a, it's it's a little funny to talk about stealing ideas because um, I'm one of these people that I don't really think, and this is one thing we had up on our website for a while um, that was on our company philosophies at Ideal Comics. We don't really think there are new stories. There's just new ways of telling the same stories, um, and and it's not that there can't be originality in it. It's just that you know we live in a in a, in a there's a, a an end to the universe, right? It's expanding, but you could theoretically find the end of it, you know. Um, of course, you couldn't get there before the end moved because it's so huge. But you know what I mean, right? <laughs> uh, the reason that, you know, the, the, the ancient myths can appeal to us is because they do reflect parts of our lives. And I think superhero stories, that's my favorite genre, of course. Um, right on. And it is, uh, it is, uh, it's because they're, they're, I think they're, they're metaphors for our existence, um, I think um, they're they're modern fairy tales, and I think fairy tales are a way of explaining deep truths in simple ways, so that we understand them subtextually. And so, for me, uh, when you talk about stealing ab aspects of universes, I think at the same time it's like, well, it's it's because it's really part of your universe. You just may not realize it in that way. You're right. It's not stealing. It's mine to begin with. I made it. Yeah. yeah all right. <laughs> no, it just you're, it comes it comes to fault with with our existence. It's like one of the things I think is really cool about the the concept of the four horsemen that Cody talks about is that those, those, um, those are motivations, you know, the, the, you know, war, pestilence, famine, um, are, are motivations that we have naturally that are good. But when we allow ourselves to be controlled by our, our motivations, they become vices, you know? And, uh, and I think that's a really powerful, um, mythic element, um, to work into a thing. And I think with, with one of the things he's, that Cody's done with the iron verse is it's very tangible because they're characters, so we get to understand that in an, an allegorical sense where, you know, otherwise you just get to sit back and philosophize about the panic of famine. And it's not this, it doesn't have the same action feeling, you know. No, it doesn't. Um, that's why we like, why I like superheroes as well. It's not my direct genre. I play with too many genres at once, if, if anything. I mean, fantasy, Western, science fiction, a uh, little bit of superhero in there. Uh it's it's that there are these bigger the thought forms, these ideas mm -hmm. uh, that you can play dress up with and have them clash, <laughs> and, it, and that that act of of taking them out of their original context and and replacing them into a uh, a new context so that the the perspective can 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 be uh, hopefully w uh, more widely seen but uh if anything at least it's a different perspective than grinding away at the same you know actual existence bit of of these you know these problems these these troubles these uh these uh hard bits of life i'm, I'm sorry did you say we play dress up well uh you, I with ideas yes. absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Well, I think that's. Really I mean, what you do on your own time, also, you know. Oh, well, you know. I'm, no, not and, I'm not. I'm. I'm not kink shaming. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, oh goodness. Um. Anyway, but I think that's a. I think there's a real aspect of that too, because one of the things that I love about fiction, um, especially in terms of, um, of of dealing with stories for youth, right? The idea, and that's what comic books really started as stories for 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 young men for children. Um, and I think they I think they have importance beyond that in the same way that fairy tales do, but um, that um, the 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 biggest thing about it is they allow us to take these complex ideas from the real world and play with them in an intellectual space that is safe. So we can understand peril and danger, um, and and boldness and courage in a way that 
isn't the same as as you know actually facing these you know face to face we can develop the mental acuity to deal with the traumas and struggles we will have down the road um and i think that's i think all hero literature um goes to that in a lot of ways that it's about the uh the, okay the metal's got a zelda hat on. i mean a link hat on now so Zelda. I've got too much stuff over here. I can't believe it. You can't. You can't keep mentioning dress up. I'm embarrassed because <laughs> I said the wrong thing. <clears throat> so, uh, Fly Fox Pro, yes. no. um, you have done some writing and you are doing some more. Um, what are your thoughts on on what it takes to make a world? Um, my personal thing is that I think it takes a lot of uh, a lot of thought. A lot of thought should should go into it. When you're making multiple stories, or you're you're uh, you're trying to intertwine things, there should be a lot of thought about why do these characters need to interact, or what makes this character worth following. You know, you look at somebody like Indiana Jones, and he has, let's say, three adventures. Let's not count the the television show. Let's not count Kingdom of Come the on, Crystal. State of Atlantis was an amazing. All right. Video. Okay. So. We'll add in the Lucasfilm game, all right? Uh, but you, you have essentially three stories, and you can assume that he has more. But I think for most people in the world, they probably have about one or two interesting, sto interesting stories that are worth following. And so you have to really develop those characters, and then you have to give us a reason why they need to interact with other characters. Mm. There has to be some thought put into, like, why do they need to exist in the same world? Why can't I just make it a, a wholly new independent story. And so I spend a, a great deal of, of time thinking about, about how they interact. And for example, I have a, a story that's basically a fictional story within one of my, uh, within my like sort of main comic book universe. Um, it's a, it's a fictional story within it that inspires other characters who then, act in certain ways because of this fictional character. And so that exists on like these two levels. You have, you have a story that otherwise wouldn't really fit into that fictional world, mm. but it's being added to it by becoming fiction itself in that world, just like it might inspire us outside of it. And, uh, and that way you're not just being postmodern for postmodern sake, but it actually has a purpose in that world. Um, side note, uh, some old metalhead has joined the chat. Thank you for coming. I want to offer congratulations on his just wrapped successful campaign, which I was five minutes late to back. <laughs> so oh. I, I went to go to the thing and I was like, I, and by the time I got around to it, it closed. So curse me for delaying on that, but yeah. um, congrats, man. Yeah. Yeah. He did it. He did it. The campaign went really well. And I'm, I'm really glad to see that it'll be getting going out, even though I, I suck. <laughs> but no, I think I think you're right. The idea that you know when we're dealing with shared universes, what really needs to fit together. And Cody was talking earlier about the idea of of taking uh, characters representing ideas and put it and and pairing them together. And one of the things that really kind of got me thinking about it is the whole Batman Superman dynamic, right? Um, Batman is is everything a person could be if they wanted to, and Superman's everything a person would want to be but can't. And that's a; uh, those are, are are interesting ideas, especially when you think about their difference in approach toward, you know, what saving the day means to Batman versus what saving the day means to Superman. Um, and those are ideas that we ne can't necessarily really play with or see pan out in a real way in the real world, because none of us can't can be what we would want to be, but can't. So we can't really see that. Um, Unless you get into metaphysics and religion, which you know that's a it's only good give me a few years. Yeah, that's a or what now? Is it or just give me a few years? <laughs> I, no. <laughs> <laughs> so metal. Let me ask you this: yeah. when it comes to uh, looking at, at fictional universes, what do you think are some of the biggest? Um, <laughs> Sorry, I had to come. I had to laugh here. I'll get to your question in a second, but uh, well, Metalhead says building universes, duct tape, bubblegum, spit, grit, and tears. Lots and lots of tears. I absolutely agree with that. 
Every anyway, world needs an ocean. Oh man. Um, but back to what I was saying, what do you think are some big mistakes that, that, that writers make in trying to craft these fictional universes we tell stories in? Hmm. Well, I, I think a lot of it is because they're too character focused when it comes to universe itself. Right. And characters are important, but they're important to the story. So overall you should be story focused. And I know one of the things that I do is I just write all my stories and I know the mechanics of how their worlds work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't plan on all of them being in the same universe at first, but they all, all the mechanics work the same no matter where you go. So it's like, okay, it just makes sense that they're all in the same universe. And I just kind of started clipping things together. Um, but I think when people start building the universe, they don't know how the foundational things of how everything works, whether it's physical mechanics, like how physics works in the world, or if it's just like, the philosophical principles to the world right and then some people try to put in stories that philosophically just don't mesh together so they're still that, breaking mechanics they're just not breaking mechanics in the way that you traditionally think about it right and that's like one thing looking at like the dc universe right mm -hmm. super speed the flash and batman and superman use don't really work in real world physics so we have to imagine some things and mark yeah. Wade the speed force to explain some of those things and it's fun you know, where does all of Wally's extra mass go as he approaches the, the speed of light? Oh, into the speed force, right? So that's 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 something. But at the same time, when they created the new 52, then they tried to melt in the uh, the the Wildstorm universe. The Wildstorm universe philosophically didn't line up. Yeah, it's at all. Physics wasn't the same. It's it's a concept of deity wasn't the same. It's ideas about morality weren't the same as the DC universe. And I think a big reason the new 52 didn't work is because it was the DC universe as imagined through the filter of the Wildstorm universe, and they, they just don't fit together at all. It's kind of like a patchwork universe in yeah, a way. Yeah. yeah. Well, and everything felt like, you know, like it was coming out of a 90s comic instead of a DC comic. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, except for Green Lantern, that can stay the same. <laughs> well, I actually think that, that that whole thing was a mistake, if you ask me, but I think. Uh, the minute the minute uh that uh how wasn't dead something broke don't get me wrong his death was crap like they handled it very poorly but Let's just rewind all the way before that <clears throat> but his his yeah but his his time in the sun was over man you know Kyle yeah. was such a better character and so was guy Gardner and so was yeah. Sean Stewart yes oh man did you guys Total side note from the topic, but has anybody besides me read Green Lantern Mosaic? No. Okay. I know, like, Gerard Jones, the guy who wrote it, is a creep. Go look it up. It's disgusting. But the guy could write, and Green Lantern Mosaic is my favorite Green Lantern series. It's just, like, super hard questions. It's great science fiction adventure. It's wonderful. So... It's a real shame that that Gerard Jones could not control his vices, but I tell you what, he did wrote a couple of really good series. That that one and his El Diablo series are just they are they are great books. Anyway, um, but yeah. So, um, Paula, what do you think are some problems people have in building universes? Um, well, I do think that they don't usually think through the um. Well, like you were saying, the metaphysics of it and, you know, how it, if you're doing a crossover, how it's going to mesh up with the way that the other world works. But also, I don't think that people interact with the world that they're set in very naturally, usually. Mm -hmm. So, like, if, if you grow up in a place where a mammoth, like wander outside your window every day, that's going to be pretty normal. And you're going to understand that, you know, you don't go out while they're out there because they will kill you. And uh, you're not going to do these things that are too stupid to live. You're going to be adapted to your environment. Right. So I think a lot of people there, they're, they're uh, thinking, Oh, well, we're going to put something in here that it looks cool. Like, Oh, superheroes crashing through buildings all the time. Um, nobody's going to want to live there. Yeah, that's one yeah, thing. I'm, like, I'm wondering why does anyone live in Metropolis now? Yeah, 
Oh, it's there's, a, there, there's, there's a zone there's where, where Superman's trying to stay above when he does these midair battles. Well, and the funny thing is that, like, if if they was having those midair battles in some places, somebody would just be shooting them from the ground. That's the funny thing to me. Um, but no, I think that I think there's definitely something for that, and I think that <clears throat> modern comics get that a uh, miss that in a way that I think some some classic comics didn't. Some Bronze Age and Silver Age comics um, had a had because they weren't crashing through giant buildings, right? The the yeah. the superheroes, the supervillains, except for Skylights. Right, um, a lot of crashing through skylights in Bronze Age books. It's one of my favorite cliches. I love it. Um, I use it in way too many stories that you haven't read yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a lot of people who do not want a skylight anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, actually, those, and, those things like attract superheroes, like bug zappers. Well, and like, and that, and the. In, in in our universe, actually, the 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 urban destruction has a a, a there's a, a motivation behind all of that. That's part of our deep lore too. That I don't want to get into right now, but um, but yeah, and I, I think that the the idea you're talking about um, characters not interacting with their environment in a normal way, and it reminded me of a great counterexample, which is the the the, uh, the Silver Age books, Turox on a Stone. I don't know if anybody besides me has read those old books, but Turok and his buddy, um, I can't remember his friend's name or his cousin, I think it was, who end up there. There are a couple of Native Americans that are pre-Columbian and they um, uh, go into a cave and they find themselves in a cave where like time has stood still and there's dinosaurs and there's um, cave people and there's, you know, different uh, anthropods and all kinds of stuff. It's a prehistoric world that's been set aside in time. And so Turok and his and his and his cousin, they're out fish out of water, right? Um, they're they're amazing hunters, they're amazing um, survivors, all that kind of stuff. Um, but th for them, all of this stuff is out of the ordinary, right? Because it's dinosaurs and it's you know it's, it's you know big gorilla men or what and all sorts of stuff. Um, but for the natives, they they all for them it's just a day, it's Tuesday, right? <laughs> and they do a really good job, I think. Uh, the, the different writers who handled it back in the '60s did a really good job of of playing with that dynamic, where um, you know th the main characters were, even though they were pre-Columbian Native Americans, um, uh, and they still were a proxy for the reader who doesn't understand the rules of the world in which they find themselves, um, but are still capable of survival. Um, whereas the, 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 the normal citizenry and the, where they, it's just a normal day for them. They have their own whatevers. So I thought that was a, I, I love Turox on a stone. It's one of my favorite, favorite silver age comics. So not a superhero book per se. <laughs> uh, Cody, when you were coming up with the iron verse, what do you think were the hardest things that you had to wrestle with to, uh, to get your ideas put together? I um I, I went about it again. I I tried to boil it down to simple things, so it wasn't very difficult for me once I was you know knew what simple things I wanted to 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 address. So I had the the original concept of, of Jack that that came first. I liked that idea. It was something I needed to explore because something I kind of feel we all have to bear a lot of the weight of this world, e even if it's just in passing, and um we also need to continue in it. And so I made a character who has no choice in either. Um, so that was the main bit. And then, you know, uh, let's, let's uh, make that really hard on him. Let's make the world fall apart. And so I've, I looked at that, at, you know, uh, classic bits. Uh, again, my, my, I was coming for something, you know, I want to strike at something very precise. Uh, so I, I, uh, Four Horsemen are a classic archetype people recognize, and uh, they can be utilized in a very wide manner. Um, and uh, that, you know, once I kind of had the that dynamic of, of them as what I wanted, then I let the Four Horsemen build my universe. What would they be doing to to manifest themselves? What would they do to each other, do to the universe, do to the, the, the people there? And I just needed to come up with, you know, how do they manifest? How would they come? And it's just like a, you reach a certain level uh, of uh, whatever aspect that they represent. 
boom, they manifest and then they start pushing you further until they own you. And um, that built the whole universe for me, just those concepts. And uh, it, it allows, again, allows a, a great deal of freedom to oppose these things in, in many different ways. Plague is, is, is reckless science, but he can be a lot of other things too. Uh, uh, same with war. It can go from very brutal, you know, smashing a guy's head in with a rock to a precise laser blast from, you know, orbit. It, 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 there's a lot of different characters within those characters to explore and oppose. Well, I mean, and, one thing um, about the, the war thing too is it even gives you the flexibility of playing with uh, like psychological warfare or yes, or like I've been I've been recently uh, re re. Um, visiting the uh the destruction or not destruction but the, the uh defeat of babylon by the persians you know and they they snuck in at night and overwhelmed them with sheer numbers and there was no battle you know the the, the babylonians were so overwhelmed by the stealth of the persians they just were like we give up don't kill us and then they killed a few of them yeah. anyway, you know. <laughs> no, exactly or you can explore that mongol version where they were just a roaming horde who uh, owned all of this big chunk of the world simply through fear not numbers not capability but but the fact that they would run in and annihilate anything that would oppose them to the point of just complete dehumanization just just yep. guts you know uh, it was just such a shocking thing that they were able to hold this power for as long as they did th with as little as they had just through again psychological warfare just a less uh uh subtle version <laughs> but uh it, it's uh, that, that kind of idea um plague can go from the microbial to the kaiju you know to massive monsters he can go from technology to biology um there's all kinds of aspects there there's a lot of funky stuff that even we as people are messing with on all those spectrums and um it gives those opportunities. Uh, famine is reckless consumption. And uh, here we know it a lot as, you know, the, the corporatocracy, but uh, it, it can be a lot more than that as well um, because it takes, it, there's a certain joy that famine takes in all of this because it makes him stronger mm -hmm. to, to make you suffer longer. And so there's that kind of sadism to him as well. And, um, that's the hardest one, to be fair, and it should be. I'm going to keep it that way as well. Uh, he's, you know, we don't really know death. Well, our readers aren't really going to know him until we're going to drop the hammer. But that's that's a very long time off if we get that far. But but that was, you know, we I tried to build it off of that simplicity where they are building the universe. How would they interact? And I get to... Uh, pick the path they choose to do that but they all have to come from a a logical framework of progression it has to come from you know it's not just all of a sudden something happens like this because it sounds cool no it, it there has to be some reason that path was taken or else we're not going to take that path because you're building a, a a faulty structure for your world if you start taking illogical paths to justify um cool moments <laughs> if I had a cool moment, that would work. And that's actually a good, a, a, a really good question here. Um, I know because one of the things that I, that I struggle with sometimes with, with talking with collaborators about stuff is uh, we've spent 15 years working on the rules of our universe, right? We're, we're coming down to the very bottom of it here and, uh, and trying to try to talk about how, we, what, what things can do, can't do. Right. Um, and, Sometimes somebody will pitch an idea and I'm like, no, that doesn't work because of X, Y, and Z. And then sometimes when my collabs will get kind of huffy at me and I'm like, dude, this is the sandbox. <laughs> somebody has to play continuity editor. Somebody has to play continuity cop and that's me. Um, I'm the one with the giant documents and the, the Bible and all that kind of stuff that I've been keeping since 2005. Don't cross yeah, see, that's out. another thing that's key, too, I've found is, is uh, particularly with collaborations, you do need that Bible, that document. Uh, we, we call it a compendium at Ironverse. We have the Ironverse compendium. So we have our, our histories of our characters. We have their motivations, their, 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 uh, their goals. And um, that, that has been extremely essential to keeping the continuity, you know, working. <laughs> keeping the machine turning instead of grinding against itself till it breaks. For sure. So here's a question for the whole panel. Um, in coming up with ideas that you'd like, that you feel are a good fit for you, 
your universe, are there any things you've come up with that don't fit that you have to just chuck because they don't fit as part of the universe? I, I had to separate out an entire series that was originally supposed to be in the Soulbound universe mm -hmm. because it, it goes to sci-fi and there's not enough like legend that at the back at the behind of it, you know? So actually it's more based on closer to our world in a superhero universe. So I had to separate out the whole thing. It had to be its own series. It couldn't go in the club with the other stories. And it was very sad because I was going to have like this 10 story overarching, uh, well, arc <laughs> over the, <laughs> this overarching arc over the <laughs> whole realm that, uh, there would be 10 stories and inside each of the stories, there would be 10 stories set in that era. And there would be a total of 10 errors. And now it was, it was beautiful. And then it didn't work. Metal. How about you, man? Actually so far, no, yeah. everything just kind of works. It's probably just the way my brain goes about thinking about things and all the stuff just kind of naturally lines up with each other anyway. But I think it's also because so far I'm only working by myself, so I haven't had to have that problem either. <laughs> that makes sense. Put other make... people into the mix, then we'll see what happens. <laughs> Cody, what about you, man? Um, nothing I can remember specifically. So my my original drafts uh, of the Jack Iron scripts were very derivative. So I'm glad I chucked all of those. I guess that could count. But the, the rules of the universe and the world didn't change too much. It's just more the character traits and, and abilities and such that just didn't fit the, the personality or, or, or allow the personality to be communicated how I wanted. And so that got refined um, alongside working with, with my artists. Uh, it, it's been... Um, I'm I, I I always err on collaboration. If it's a good idea, it's a good idea, and as long as it'll work, then I'm fine. I can usually dance around that stuff. And what it has happened with that kind of uh, interaction is everything's gotten refined, gotten more defined, and allowed me to uh, understand the personality of what this universe needs to be because it's not just me making it. So mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, given it a, a wider breadth. Uh, than, than I could have. And um, really, there's been... Uh, working with, with, with Dollar Coins, the, the creator of Cactus Coyote, for instance, he's chucked out, oh, God, like five scripts for that, and he's written over, like, 50 issues. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a weird, weird thing to, to, to refine like that. But again, I tried to give us as many as wide of a base as solid of a foundation as possible to do any kind of crazy thing so it's been very hard for me to find anything that we couldn't justify some way uh but nobody has really tried to uh that i've worked with tried to inject anything that wasn't already kind of communicated in there you know the vibe nobody's trying to do an erotica <laughs> in our universe for instance uh there is some sexy stuff the dollar coins puts into his manga because that's kind of how it goes but it's not um it's not a main focus. Uh, that would be one of the main things is, is uh, it would be hard to explore certain tones with, with what we built, but uh, it is all possible. I would say it just depends on how you want to do it. Now, every character isn't going to be able to, to pull off every story, of course. Right. So that's kind of where you can change it. You follow somebody else on a distant world and then boom, you're fine. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I found it, um, not so likely to have to chuck out stuff as long as you're real communicative and, and willing to be a, you know, a, a solid collaborator and um, you don't mind a, a, a little new blood injected into what you were thinking. Right. I found that constantly with my artist, uh, completely different pages than what I wrote and had in mind, but they're the same page. It's just better. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's a wonderful journey and I'm, proud to take you know be in comics it's freaking enjoyable oh yeah twitless are there any things i know that i know you've already talked about this for super school there's really nothing off the table because it's just a lark well okay in a way there is because like it's uh, the continuity cop is taylor because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i'm the one who will who i'll sacrifice anything for a funny joke um but uh, taylor will be the one who says no 
that's not what Brad would say. That's not what Frankie would say. And I'm like, but it'd be funny if we had to <laughs> something completely out of character here. So he's the one who kind of like holds me in line uh, for the comedy strip. Um, when it comes to the more serious uh, superhero uh, work that I'm working on right now, um, my, my approach is kind of uh, different because um, uh, I've, I've certainly chucked a lot of stuff. But to me, um, I feel like uh, there's like two aspects to world building. There's uh, character and setting. Um, yes. And uh, uh, the more important thing to me is character. Uh, because, uh, and both, both are important, but I think character is the one that takes, pri you know, kind of primus. It's the most, uh, important. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, cause, cause without like, you can have like an extremely like well-crafted world. And I've, I've spent some time, I've had some fun, like, you know, thinking about, oh, I could have this in a world and this in a world and I could pull in this mythology. But then when I start working with the actual character I want to work with, if I'm not getting any traction there, it doesn't matter how well I've constructed the setting. Um, the stories aren't just going to be uh, as interesting. So to me, I, uh, in terms of world building, uh, you know, I really want to have a, a really awesome character. And uh, right now, the world building that's evolving for the Adventures of Omega Girl, it happens through the stories. And so what ends up happening is over the course of the stories, the world kind of like, I discover more things about the world. Cause it's like, okay, in this story, we're going to explore the, uh, um, the music hall, the, uh, the angel city music hall. Um, and so it, we get to be, uh, you know, discover what that looks like and what would happen in that place and how Omega girl would interact with that. Um, a story we're working on right now, um, She's fighting an electricity-based villain who's uh, hijacking into a whole bunch of uh, technology firms. So we get to see how she interacts with that. And we also get to explore how uh, the world interacts with, you know, an electricity-based supervillain. And over time, the world building builds on its own organically. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have a story Bible that kind of has the basics. Um, but uh, I kind of like to world build through storytelling. And what the other side to world building on my that uh, I think is interesting is that there's the uh, the front facing part, which is what yeah. the readers see. And then there's the back, you know, the behind the scenes stuff. And so the important thing is that the illusion for the reader is consistent because I could change things, you know, three times a week and be like, no, this was actually going on behind the scenes. No, actually, this is what's going on behind the scenes. In fact, I think that's, you know, the better way to approach world building. Um, as long as from the reader's point of view, it appears the illusion is consistent. Yeah, I think that's an important one. We just recently had a um, one of our characters that shows up in our webcomic um, was actually created for um, trying to think of how to tell the story succinctly. So when we first developed I the Ideal Comics universe, um, my buddy Chris Lawton and I, we were um, collecting rejection letters from other publishers. And so we were working on, on pitch scripts, on, on samples, on elevator pitches to mail away to different publishers to try to get some traction. And everybody told us no. Um, and what we realized, we'd meet every week, we'd meet over coffee and pie and look at each other's things we'd refined or things we'd changed and script ideas we had. And we realized that it was all kind of fit together, that we had the same kind of underlying rules for all of our pitches, whether they were, a, you know, um, adventure stories with archaeologists, whether they were science fiction stories, whether they were, you know, uh, superhero stuff. It all kind of had the same underlying tones to it. So we decided to make a universe. Right. Um, and um, with that, um, goodness sakes, I forgot where I was talking about. Oh, <clears throat> Um, the illusion so, of movement. The illusion of change. Um, but yeah, one of the things about it is, is one of the stories Chris came up with, he had a, a character um, called Shock, who is uh, a paranormal agent for a, a superhero um, contract security agency. Um, and uh, he had a particular origin set out for him. And uh, about a year ago, it had never been talked about. Um, and he, he just, he'd shown up in one story as, as a character and we know his, whose character is and what his personality is. Um, and I, I said, said, I'd like to readdress his origin story that we've never told. Um, I think this fits better. And I gave my reasons and Chris says, yes. <laughs> so there's, I definitely see that there's, there's, um, um, uh, uh, some room for like, you know, making sure that the, the back end, um, has, but it actually, it ends up having the same theme as that Chris told just with a slightly different flair to it. 
Um, we took a, um, a man who was a disgraced cop and turned him into a disgraced fire uh, inspector. Um, and uh, so we've got a whole different level of, of, uh, of past to him, but it's the whole, but it's an interesting um, aspect to all of that. So, um, but yeah, I think that that's um, uh, the idea on this. Actually, I'm going to change topics a little bit. Um, well, I'll actually, I don't want to do that yet. Um, a fly fox. Are there any times you've had to um, cut out stories, cut out ideas because they didn't fit with the subtextual rules of your universe? Uh, usually I just blend them. Like if I come up with an idea I really like and it's just not working right or it's going to cause conflict, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take the elements I like from that, either the characters or the storyline or some sort of powers, and I'll, I'll meld that with something else that's already in the world. That way all the good stuff that I liked is still there, but I don't have to try to, to uh, you know, to force it in or and I don't have to just forget about it. You know, I can, I can take those good elements. So a lot of my stuff is stuff that I've thought about over a long time. And then I, I sort of combine the elements and realize, Oh, that fits well together. So yeah. I'm going to, um, I'm going to make that character just a single character and he's going to have both of those powers or he's going to be able to have both of those abilities because they really work well together. And that's something I sort of took from fantasy writers like Brandon Sanderson does that a lot. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He has like a $5 million Kickstarter right now. He actually has uh, a really good lecture series that teaches uh, sci-fi and fantasy writing free on YouTube. That yeah, I really it's watch. definitely worth watching. A lot yeah. of good information there. Um, but one of the things he does is he'll, he makes these amazing magic systems. And he'll, he'll, he does it all the time. He'll make a new magic system. And then he writes it down. And sometimes later he realizes, oh, those really work well together. And so if I, if I combine those, those worlds, then it'll actually make for a more richer world. And his world building is off the charts. Like some of the best world building um, in, in any kind of fiction. And it, most, a lot of his stories are, are, are set within this universe called the Cosmere and they all relate to each other in this grand epic, like, you know, in the, in the classic sense of, of DC comics or Marvel, where everything's tied together and there's this grand big epic story that's going to eventually have a crossover. And it's, it's really, uh, I had, would encourage anybody to look at that and see what he does in terms of melding his stuff together. Yeah. That's one thing that I really, and maybe it's just me, maybe it's me being old and cranky and maybe it's like losing the, the, the pure joy I had when I was a young person reading comics, but it really seems like both DC and Marvel are telling less stories in a single universe and more stories in like a magic, the gathering card deck. Right, where there's similar elements, but the stories don't really seem to interact in the way they felt like when I was a kid. Right, and uh, I think um, that part of that, if I may say, I think part of that the problem has been crossover events. I know that we all hate them for, for certain reasons, and we all love them for certain reasons. But when you're a kid, at least for me, I, I grew up reading a lot of Silver Age stuff, Silver Age and Bronze Age stuff before there was these huge events, and the world felt bigger because you'd see a little bit of a character. And then you'd be able to go and you'd be able to jump into his book and he had all these complete stories that were there for you to read. And now I think with the crossover events, it's like, okay, this character crossed over and then I go over to his book, but there's an event going on. And so it's really just the same story and it, yeah. it's less and, stories being told. And it's also like the idea that we used to have backups, right? Yeah. And so like, if you were reading tech in the sixties, every month you got an elongated man story and a Batman story. And the totally different tones, totally different concepts, totally different feels, but they were both individual detective stories. You got to play detective along with Ralph Dibney and play detective along with Bruce Wayne. And like now, like you could read six months of detective comics and have one case. Right? <laughs> it's just like, look, I know who did it after issue two. Can we just move along? I don't, I don't. And I, one of my pet peeves with, with a lot of Batman is it's not about the cases. It's about, you know, Bruce's fun personal problems. And uh, I, I'm not that interested. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> with his yeah, trauma reaction. That point, you know, like, have you lost the, the, the point of the book? If it's, yeah. if there's it not is called detective, detective Comics. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think that there's something about that that's a factor. But, um yeah, so um, darn it, 
I had a question, and I didn't write it down. Typical Reese. Uh, that's the truth. That's the truth. I run off my hip all the time, just pam pam, and I'm I'm running late there. So, um, how I remember it now. Um, when it comes to world building, how intense, how deep do you guys go before you start working on a thing? Yeah, can you can you clarify that point? Ah, so like you're talking about um, discovering the the geography of your town as you go. Yeah, that's how I do it too. I know I know the history of the towns I, of our fictional cities. I know how they fit into the thing. I've I've, I've kind of mapped it out on our big timeline, and we have our our Bible broken up into several distinct files. We've got one for the characters. You've got one for the timeline. We've got one for geography, right? Um, and so like, I know all of that, those little, those little tidbits. And I, and I, as we come up with different stories, I tweak the timeline or I add characters to the character log and all that kind of stuff. Um, but how deep, how much do you know before you guys individually start? Cause I know like, I don't have geography of my towns mapped out, right? When we were doing, um, one of the things we did in preparation for the, the expositioner book that isn't done yet was we actually decided finally where in Colorado it is. And we, we have the geographical, like, actually know where it is. Um, but we didn't know that for the first 15 years we were telling ideal comic stories. It was just somewhere in Colorado, somewhere near Denver, right? Um, and like our other cities, well, and actually Urbania, in South Carolina, I know exactly where that is on a map too, but the other ones we don't know. So <laughs> oh, when it comes to those those fictional elements of your universe, how much of it do you have mapped down before you start writing stories? Or do you have the rough ideas of your rules, of your lore, and then go from there? Paula, let's start with you. Uh, it really depends on how busy I am because I <laughs> run through my stories in my head, you know, over and over and over again when I'm doing something really deadly boring, like washing dishes, washing clothes, sorting stuff. And, uh, you know, if I've got a lot of that going on, then I can get a very complete world built before I actually go and actually write it down. Which is great because then when I do get a chance to write it down, I'm in such a panic because somebody is going to need me in like 10 minutes. So I rush and I get it all down on the paper and I have to stop in the middle of it. Well, not the paper, but, you know, digitally. And uh, so I stop in the middle and generally I can pick up where I can where I left off. So, yeah, boredom, 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 panic. And that's how I build things. Fly Fox Pro, um, what's your take on that, man? I'm pretty similar. I, I think about this stuff a lot before I, um, I really get down to it, and then sometimes I just go off the cuff. You know, like I'll, I'll start writing something down. And I realize, oh man, this is pretty good stuff. I need to make sure that this fits, and then I have to go back and and sort of retroactively figure out if it exactly works. And that's when I get stuff like where I um, I make it a fictional property within that world so that I can still have it in my world in a sense as a, as a feature, but not as – so that it's not breaking the world. So I do think about it quite a bit beforehand. Um, yeah. Cody, what about you, man? Um. Uh, again, you know, we kind of spoke earlier that you know uh, a character kind of takes takes precedence over those uh, the 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 well, it takes precedence in world building a little bit for me as well. It started with the characters as the icons and then how they would affect their world. Um, all I needed was that base, and then I could explore what I wanted. So that's what I started as. Uh, eventually, I wanted something a little bit more solid, a little bit more mechanically sound, and that's when we've been kind of been working it out. Um, of course, I run it in the back of my head like all you guys do too all the time. But the uh, when I first started, that wasn't wasn't the goal, um, and uh, since it's become a little bit more of the goal. Uh, most everything I, I've uh, 
written uh, short stories and a few other things take place in in the iron verse and so it helps me flesh out the rules and get an actual tale told that that expresses those rules and and uh, allows me to stretch them a little bit too which is which is good so uh, honestly I, I don't need too much but i uh i need that foundation uh, for sure and if if i have some form of uh, of the foundation then i then i can usually go at it if uh if I've got that inspiration going, that that's the main thing. I need that almost more than a, the foundation. <laughs> yeah, for for me, when it comes to our, our big world stuff, we started with three stories that we had we had written that really fit these particular rules we had. One was Forces of Good and Evil, our superhero comedy, and then um, Chris did a, had a had a mystery that he he had uh, pitched called. October leaves, uh, and then I had, um, which we've not finished, and then I had a tragedy that I call "Whom the Gods Destroy," um, and um, and it's a political tragedy that I also haven't finished, but I had like the the bones of all of this, um, and those formed our our subtext, and on that, um, what we really attached it to was. Um, we set up our, our timeline of the 20th century roughly to match the progression of comics. So um, the golden age that we have, because we have a golden age, we have a, an initial hero that kicks it off, who's the first hero that inspires all the other heroes. Um, he's not the first super being. Those are go all the way back to myth, to the foundations of the earth. But um, the first hero inspires all the others. And take and he, we have him appear in 1938. Um, and and starts the the the, the realm of heroes and he, the second hero is a is an urban avenger um, and so we have a have a have a have a magical superman and we have an urban avenger and we have a have a golden age archer that forms our, our original triumvirate of heroes uh, and then we have a, a silver age where 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 things are, are a resurgence of superheroes that come on the scene when the time is right and. And we have a, a Bronze Age where they where things become more serious, and we have an Age of Pockets where um, all of our heroes are edgy and 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 over serious and, and all that kind of stuff. And that led into our, our modern era where we started with Force of Good and Evil, um, where things are 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 somewhat serious in some ways and somewhat dire in others. And so, um, and uh, and all of that came from that same kind of thing. They started with. What were the core things that connected our original three pitches, um, and that kind of spun out from there, and all of our alternate history, and and then a lot of our history, because we actually ended up having an alternate history that goes back to the very beginnings of the Earth, <laughs> the very creation of the world, is a little bit different than it is in our world, and those were just logical extrapolations of the world that we built going backwards, um, <laughs> and so. Um, but not all of that was done before we started. When we started with, we just had three separate ideas um, that were self-contained stories that we didn't think would connect to anything else that we thought had market potential as we were trying to pitch them around. And, um, and we really could never get, the, get it off the ground uh, with those ideas. And um, actually, Forces, which we've been doing since 06, uh, um, for free on the internet, forcegoodandevil.net. Check it out. It's hilarious. You'll love it. Um, uh, it's uh, we started that um, just as two writers who didn't really do art, um, just as an excuse to get our ideas out to the world for free. We thought if we could lure somebody with our fun, we could maybe convince them to read the the, the gritty detective stories that we had planned. <laughs> so, still banking on that. Um, but yeah, Twitless for you. What 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 uh with um. How much research or, or background, I should say, did you have when putting together um, Omega Girl? All right. So um, I'm actually working with Omega Girl with another uh, person. So kind of another collaborative effort. Um, so what's interesting is a chunk of that comes from uh, gaming, actually. Um, and uh, one thing I have learned in terms of storytelling and world building is um, not to over not to overdo it. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I sometimes have ideas that I think are good, and then um, you know, in a practical, uh, once I start applying them, they just all fall apart. Uh, so, um, okay, so so for example, um, 
I had uh, I was playing this role playing. I do a lot of role playing games, or I did. Um, I might be playing one right now in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Neverwinter Nights queued up. <laughs> if anyone remembers that. Oh, that's a great one. Um, but uh, no, it's it's great because like it's it's you know you can kind of D and D is so slow. You don't have to really pay attention to what you're doing. You don't really have to pay attention to what you're doing, especially the way I play. I play Necromancer, so I just have my uh, my minions just kill everything. Um, no, sorry, bringing it back to the actual storytelling. So um, I do a lot of role playing and stuff, and uh, I had a whole bunch of ideas that I thought would work, and then um, you know I had this whole like mystery plot that the players were going to like uncover, and then what I started noticing was that the um, the players. Uh, would would kind of chat uh, and talk about what they thought was coming up next. And their ideas were like 10 times better than what I had planned. <laughs> so what I would do is I would just eavesdrop on what they were doing. And then I would pretend that again, I would just steal their ideas and I would go, Oh no, that those awesome ideas you've been, you've been theorizing and story crafting. Cause you know, six minds are better than one. And I'd be like, no, no, that's totally, uh, that was my plan all along. <laughs> Isn't it brilliant? And they're like, Oh, this is story so great. And I'm like, yeah, this is how, yeah. how to do it. Um, no. it great is your idea. <laughs> yeah, it's totally my idea that I could. Hey, you always meet their expectation. Oh, I did. No, so the thing that I learned was that, um, and I've learned how to to do this a lot is to you know have like certain frameworks, but to be very very open to change and to be very open to like a completely radical. Uh, I have a background in uh, teaching writing. And we call it radical revision, where you go all the way back to like you know, the drawing board and re revise it. Because I had like um, oh, gosh, four or five. Uh, issues worth of dialogue written for a superhero story and um I, I bored myself to tears with it and i and i had i had like greek mythology tied into it i had a um a story arc that had symbolism in it it built up to a central image like i had all of this like like literary significance i'd attached to the story and i couldn't even make myself write it because it was so i was boring myself and i was sitting there going this is a bad sign um, if, if, yes. the author, if I as the author am boring myself to tears. So um, I just started like ditching like all that stuff and started, I know it sounds kind of, you know, reductive and stupid, but I just kind of went with what was it that drew me into comics? Mm -hmm. What is it that made me like this stuff? And so it's like, a lot of it is just the flash. It's the spectacle, it's the cool stuff. And obviously you, you have to have like stuff that makes sense but you can't lose sight of like the fun that draws us in to begin with. And so it's just interesting how like I, I started off being like, you know, super serial and building things. And then, like I said, I, I, I bored myself. <laughs> so I was like, and that's actually exactly <laughs> the opposite of my experience. Like what got <laughs> me into comics was the, was the, the complexity and the depth. Right. Sure. Um, I mean, what I said, what, what, what really got me into comics. I mean, I was reading, um, what first got me to the comic shelf was DuckTales, right? And and the great adventure stories and um, the reprints of the Carl Barks books that Gladstone was doing, doing in the early 90s. Um, that's what actually got me through the rack. But what hooked me into superhero comics was the, the depth of the world. The idea that, you know, Gotham City and a Metropolis with their own separate histories and their own separate flares and their own separate architects. architects right, right. Right, right, but if I the road from each other, and sure. the idea that you know that the post crisis DC universe goes back to the golden age and all of the stuff in that, and the idea that they live in a world where Central City was or where or, or, or Keystone City was stolen from time for 40 years, and how does that affect people that came back and all of the, the human drama related to this? So, like those long stories, those big epics were things that that's what got me into comics was all of that complexity. So of course, when we came up with the ideal comics universe, that's all in there. Right. So, even though I don't know if anybody who has read forces understands how the things that happened in the fifties are affecting these kids that are going to high school in 2004, but it's all part of that to me. <laughs> So the, the only thing I would add to that is like, you're, you're totally right. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to undersell the fact I do enjoy the depth too. like I'm, one of my favorite writers is Chris Claremont. And he puts a lot of depth into his stories. The thing that I think is interesting, again, is to point out that what brings you into the story a lot of times initially is kind of some of the flash and mm -hmm. you stay for some of the depth. Yes. But that, that the depth comes like it didn't I don't think 
if we go back to like, you know, um, and I was look, I was reading some like just first issues, Spider-Man, Iron Man, you know, Superman, Batman. And it was literally just, here's a really cool looking character. He's got some cool powers. One, two, three, go. And like the depth evolves over time. Like, again, they explore that world. They add new characters, every issue. It's a new thing. And over time it builds, yep. you know? Um, so for me, I, I, I was learning to like, to let it build over time to like, like do the snowball effect mm -hmm. because I feel, cause what kept on happening is if I tried to build too much and get too in depth before I told the stories, then what would happen is, is I would just end up retelling and revising and chucking stuff anyway, you know? So like, it was more efficient to have like, okay, here's the loose framework. Here's like some backstories that I'm totally probably going to rewrite three times. Um, and uh, like, let's, let's build as we go. Um, as opposed to having everything set in stone and then tell the stories and then realize that like, oh man, that thing I built is is really boring and uh, I don't like that or I, I I hate half of this and this person's character is stupid and I should revise it anyway. Yeah, I think that's actually, a, I think that's that that's the way to tell a story is actually to like breadcrumb it, right? Mm -hmm. When yeah. you're talking about the deep lore uh, and that way the people that are into the deep lore can seek it out and the people that are just like, I just want to watch you punch Nazis. That's all I showed up for. Okay, right. that's fine. That's fine. Conveniently, we have Nazis in the next issue. Um, uh, Nazis aren't that big a part of our universe. We beat them in World War II with superheroes. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think that's one of the things I had a, a lot of fun with in, in Forces is we have a story um, where uh, the... Uh, uh, it starts in class, and of course, it takes place in a school, right? These kids are high school students, so it starts with a lecture where they're they're learning the history of the of the disco riots. And in the uh, in our universe in the 1970s, there was a cult um, that used disco music to mind wash people uh, uh, into joining this cult and and to trying to take over America with disco music. And they were taken out by a a con, uh, a, a con a joint effort of the funk rockers and the punk rockers and uh and they wiped out the disco cult uh in the 70s and that's a whole thing in there so that sounds like um, justice to me but what do you what do you have against hippies <laughs> yeah it's 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 not, not hippies it's not hippies it's disco people it's not okay. the same it's just more like hipster yeah there's way more cocaine well maybe not more <laughs> anyway but it's a, it's a, it's it's called uh, the the story. If you want to check it out, go to Force of Good and Evil. You can go down to pick a story, and you can select the one that says Disco Fever, and check it out. It's absolutely hilarious, and I don't just say that because I wrote half of it. What did the Bee Gees do to you that would make you hate them so much? Paul said it. It was Sergeant <laughs> Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the movie. <laughs> If you haven't seen that, go like suffer through it because it's absolutely oh, worth it. It's basically just a Hanna Barbera cartoon done in live action. Oh man, it's so bad. That's, that is an insult to Hanna Barbera, my friend. That's so bad. It actually makes Beatles music bad. <laughs> and there's some decent performances in it, but even then. No, Steve, Steve Martin doing a Maxwell Silver Hammer. You got to be kidding me. That's just, that's terrible. Kind of amazing, but terrible. <laughs> so am I, are, are myself and Metal the only people that actually saw that? I've seen that part where Steve Martin's singing Maxwell Silver Hammer, and I wanted to oh. throw up. I'm, I'm sure would... everybody has heard Aerosmith's version of Come yeah. Together. Yeah, and that's like the like you know that's it, theirs wasn't terrible, but you know what the funny thing about that is, is Aerosmith was interviewed about it several times, and they were all so drugged up, none of them remember being on set. Good lord! And I'm not sure if that's true or if it's just a way of covering up the fact that they were in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. We had never. I'll tell you, this is totally off subject, but one time it was Christmas, and we were down visiting my dad in Denver. Um, and my wife and I are, we're just getting ready to go to bed and this came on and I was like, I have to watch this because it was on the, on the big screen. And so we sat there and watched it. And then afterwards we looked at each other and like, what are we doing with our lives? Just, <laughs> it was so bad, but at least 
I got to witness how bad it was. So I, I feel like I grew as a person through the suffering. He built character. <laughs> character. <coughs> oh, pardon. Choking on my own juices. That yeah, that, a, that, that's a quote. That's good radio right there. Man. I'll tell you what, that's quality stuff. In the six, I lost my train of thought coughing. So, but yeah, uh, don't mention trains. I have I have bad memories of trains. Choo choo. What kind <laughs> of bad memories of trains? I'm just making I'm just just yeah. joshing you. Here, I thought we might have an interesting personal anecdote to share <laughs> while I think of the next. All right, all right. So I was on a stream. I've been on uh, Oz Art Creations streams for the past like week. And uh, I was on the stream once with this guy called Berserk, who I actually kind of like. But he gets really, really drunk. And, um, and one time I was on a stream and uh, we were talking about comics. And then like suddenly, I don't know what happened to his brain, but he just started talking about like the Holocaust and uh, <laughs> for like no reason. And then he was like, man, Twitless, you're, you're and he just started like cursing me out. And he's like, you'd put me on a train. You wouldn't stand up for me. And I'm like, what, what are we talking about? <laughs> so like it became a whole meme. So now everyone just says choo choo and trains <laughs> and stuff. And it's just like, there's like literally no reason. <laughs> just, just a guy who got drunk. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's a weird group of people to hang out with, man. Oh, Lord. Uh, no, it was funny. Cause it's like, it's like, I think, is it called Godwin's law? I think yeah. it, was, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was it was literally just Godwin's law in action. We were talking about comics, and suddenly it was just all of a sudden about like the Holocaust. It was just yeah. out of the blue. Somebody <laughs> just felt the need to compare you to Hitler for reasons. Uh huh. Uh, it was, you went too long, so the uh, the dev team had to come in and manually force it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now we're we did, back to back to uh, RPGs. There, uh, we, we do live in a simulation. I mean, like I've. It's yeah. It was more yeah. of a complexity engine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I think it's just one facet of a greater reality, but that's a that's a whole different question there. So of course I guess we're discussing the building of build of our own universe. So that I guess it sort of fits. So um oh, yeah. I'm not gonna have Hitler in mind. Um yeah. yeah we're gonna be a, leaving out some things. Yeah, Hitler is a factor in our universe, but I don't think we'll ever bother addressing him just because the whole premise was that, like, one of the things that happens in the ideal universe is that superheroes actually intervene in World War II and stop it early. Um, so instead of ending in 45, it actually ends in 42. Um, and, uh, and so that's actually, like, that drastically changes Earth's history in the 40s, um, whereas it's a factor but not the kind of factor you think. So, um, we don't. We have a Cold War, but it's not the same Cold War, and it's a whole thing. But we haven't gotten to a lot of those stories um, in our in our materials, whether they were print or the stuff we used to have online. I still need to rebuild our website. Well, not rebuild. It's got a good build. It's just not all the content back on it like I want. I don't have enough time. The truth. So that's a good question. If I'm asking a question, how do people prioritize their stories they want, especially if they've got a, a big universe they're trying to do? What do you? How do you guys choose what stories you're going to focus on? That is a really good question. I'm going to point that to Cody to start with, though. All right. Um, honestly, I, I started with the story first. Um, basically the the idea uh, um again it's kind of a i tried to build everything organically and so that comes with the stories too so i i haven't uh mapped out so far so i can let it kind of grow and be timely if i can help it um not like pin, pigeonholed in the timing but in the timing being emotionally resonant with me i'm going to put out a better Pro, you know, a better story uh, than just forcing a good idea to exist. And so um, the first Jack Iron story, it's a lot of 
uh, teenage angst and disappointment with what humanity is, and it's a, a little bit of fun at the end just to make it easier. Uh, issue two is, you know, uh, what that led to, you know, all that darkness just brought everything down. And issue three, we get on the, the, the call to action for the hero's journey. Um, and then we actually start from there. But I had originally written like six or seven issues, and I just was putting out cool ideas and structuring uh, a concept. It was very derivative, a lot of uh, taking and borrowing more than I even do now, and I do a lot. Uh, but uh, so I, I, I don't do so much um, forethought on that. I try and let 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 it come to me, and I I'm you know I don't have deadlines. I don't have to force that. So that that's a big one. If I had deadlines, then yeah, uh, there's been a few things. Uh, the short stories I've had deadlines on, they come out good. They could have been better, uh, but uh, honestly, uh, if if there's room and inspiration, that that that's where where I pick that story, and I try to leave space for that story to happen instead of getting five, six, seven steps ahead of myself, and then I have something I want to do that doesn't fit within those steps that I've already set in motion. I, I try to avoid that. Uh, again, it's all about uh, the, the, the depth and the, and the width we have to work with and, and picking and choosing how to move that forward and what aspect of that for that story or, or what aspect of that we want to communicate in a story and, and put, put forward uh, at that time or... or uh, you know, just overall, because there is an overall kind of uh, message to what we're trying to do, too, that's going to ring throughout all the books, because uh, it's the same, it's a bunch of different beings in the same world opposing the same things, and so they all will fit together naturally uh, because of that. And um, it just allows us to, to play. I, I, I try not to get too far ahead of myself. Like, uh, I, I'm way more into uh, the, the planning of what, what led up to things in the background so that I can kind of get the setting right. That I might overthink a little much before diving into a story. But not really. I, I, I try to uh, leave the space. Uh, try, try and uh, leave me room to uh, color outside the lines when... Uh, I'm learning. <laughs> so, uh, Metal, how do you prioritize? Because you've got, what, three, four narratives that are part of your universe that are going on right now? That I know about. Let's see. That are going on right now? Well, if you count the manga that I just started putting up, right? There, There's the main webcomic for X-Time is Chaos of the same name. Uh, there's the Pop Rocks featuring Mitch and Sandy. I started the prose um, for the Chronicling of a Planet called Mira. I started prose for a horror story called Beyond the Terror Threshold. And, oh, I have a, another one sitting in the background, too. So I've got, I've got several, but those are just the ones that I've started things on. I, I probably have upwards of 50 stories planned and ready to go. I just haven't, I don't have the time to start all this stuff. Right. Uh, so prioritizing, because you don't have the time to start all this stuff. Uh, one of the reasons I picked the story that is the webcomic and is the the titular story of the whole universe is because it's the one that kind of lays the backbone of everything it is the one that kind of through it teaches you the mechanics of the universe both the uh the physics the philosophy everything about it and that's also why it's the one that kind of has like the um the insert characters because i'm like i need to focus on telling fun and interesting stories and i need to focus on telling stories that also kind of like lead people into the rest of the universe. So I need to not be focusing on developing characters and I'm just going to be cheap and use people I already know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was like, that was the important part was like this, they're all fun stories. Like I made sure that they were fun stories first, yeah. but I needed a story that was basically going to be the foundation for everything else to split off of. And that's why I prioritize that one. The other ones on the side really just comes down to like which ones would be the most fun for me to work on right now. Like the Pop Rocks one, it's like I could do that in a simple cartoony style. I could do them pretty fast uh, when I do get around to them. Uh, they share a lot of similar like comedic elements and uh, pacing themes to the main story. So people who like the main story will automatically probably like this one as well. Um, and it usually... It just comes to me which story I should be working on. 
it's not like I have to think too hard about it. It's like, yeah, it just it makes sense to start working on this one right now. Just with everything else laid out. I think it kind of just unfolds itself. Mm. Cool. Paula, how about you? How do you prioritize? Uh, real quick, guys, uh, I got to go. Thank okay. you so much for having me. Uh, something's kind of come up real quick all of a sudden I got to deal with. But uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. And, thanks, and thanks great so meeting and talking to you all. Yeah. Oh, likewise. Yeah. Yeah, All right, you have a good evening. Yeah, we'll see you around then. Um, yeah, so I didn't used to prioritize, and that meant I got nothing done. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> now uh, I've, I've got this thing going on with Asha where I'm telling her to hold off and leave me alone until I get my novel written, unless she can, like, justify her existence i will keep her in the back of my mind like right now i'm uh working on some inking for hers um but uh yeah i'm if i have somebody like waiting on it then i'm going to be working on that first and if it's if it's uh myself as a client then that's whichever one is not leaving me alone. So usually that's not more than one, but sometimes it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, you want to see my inks? Sure. I can do a screen share. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, I think so. That, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and answer for me. Um, I try to pick out which is the, um, I try to look at, um, a bunch of different stuff but first which are the ones that are are um kind of the most important um i think as far as as getting people's attention on there like if i've got a project that's in the in the middle of being done i would also try to look at what um can be done the quickest um, um right for right now I'm, I'm the project i was working on right now the collaboration i was working on today it's 12 pages and so the first um, stage of that was doing the, uh, the, the, the treatment outline. Um, that didn't take long to put together. Um, and then it's um, in conjunction with somebody else. So then the, the, the complete project is going to be according to their timeline, right? Um, for forces, I just try to get those up um, as quick as I can, um, um, whether it's um, if I'm working with an art team or whether I'm, I'm doing a big chunk of the stuff myself. Um, I just try to look at that as, as regularly as possible, unless we're going into hi, a, a hiatus and hiatus. I don't know. Um, but then it's a lot of it's about what's what's attainable in, in that whole thing. So I, I'm not sure I'm really good at priorities either, because I'll have these little <clears throat> ideas that that tease the back of my head. And um, sometimes they're easy to run with. and Sometimes they're not. But. That is an awesome rhinoceros. Yeah, nice six. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not very good at inking. So I've been practicing on Ash's story. I, I, I think you That's might cool. be wrong about that. That looks pretty good to me. Yeah. Make sure you don't look at my Twitter of what I just posted. <laughs> well, now I have to. Now I'm all curious. No, we're going to stalk you now. Uh-oh. Forget it. <laughs> but, yeah, usually I'm a little better at pencils. And uh, the, the ink, it's a little slippery, mm. it just seems to me. So I have to I have to zoom, like, way in on it, like, doing a lot of this. And you do most <laughs> of your inking on, um, uh, what do you call, a uh, computer? Uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm much better at paper, pen and ink, inking. Um, I can do that with calligraphy pen. And uh, let's see, there's, there's the colored version of Asha. And I, let's see. There's the other one. Ah, it's not doing the. Okay, there. 
So yeah, I was deciding whether to do the lighter colored background or black. So I don't know. I think the black background pops more. Yeah, it's Definitely. higher contrast. Yeah. I, I kind of like them both, honestly, but I, the, the black background definitely um, kind of draws you into her form more. It, it reminds me of the old uh, PC game, Jill of the Jungle, if anybody played that. I saw yeah. some speed runs of that the other day. Yeah. I'm going to have to look that up. They're just the, just with the colors and, the, you know, obviously being in the jungle. But uh, it's cool. Ah, thank you. Yeah, so I was thinking that uh, the lighter background might be better for an interior page. Mm. Um, but I don't know. We shall see. Ah. I think there's some sense in that. So. Oh uh, yeah. Um, By I'm the on way, Chrome, so I just got a warning that uh, said that there's a bug that sometimes will make. Windows 10 crash, so that's fun. Oh, really? Yeah, it just it uh, it said that there may be a crash uh while screen sharing on Windows 10 Ooh. with Chrome. That's weird. Yeah, that is. I actually uh, I usually actually use uh, Firefox to stream through, so I know I've never gotten a notice like that. Just because I signed in with it once and I don't want to bother getting a new cookie. That's really the only reason. So. Yeah, that's why I'm still using Chrome. I use Chrome sometimes, but not super often. So. But yeah, so Twitless, mm -hmm. how do you prioritize projects? Um, well, we, 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 sorry, world building, right? Is that the, what? I understand the question? Um, in world building in terms of, of, of work that you're putting out, however, man. Right. Well, yeah, I think I, um, I'm going to repeat myself. It's, uh, it's character. I think, um, I really like to, uh, to think about, um, I guess it's two sides to for me. Um, I love to think about really cool characters and I like to think about really cool situations for those characters. And then I kind of grow it from there. So I'll get like a really powerful image in my head. Uh, so there was a superhero story I wanted to tell where um, I, uh, the image I had in my head was a, uh, a Superman kind of Paragon character. And uh, he's, uh, he's holding up like a falling skyscraper, kind of like Atlas holds up the world. Right. You know? And I just, I loved that central image. And I, I built a lot of things around that. Um, and I still like that story. I'm going to get to it someday, but I just like that powerful image for me. And I just started kind of building around that whole like idea in my head. So um, uh, to, for, for the adventures of Omega girl, a lot of it, like I said, it's uh, it's her character and then how her character would then um, interact with a whole bunch of interesting situations. So every time it's like, can I flesh out a new interesting aspect of uh, Omega Girl or um, Amanda Shields, which is her alter ego? Um, can I can I flesh this out in an interesting way? Can I show an interesting aspect of her own personality? Um, or can I play off of that with someone else's personality being very different or a situation that would be very different. And it just kind of like, once I start asking all those questions, it just kind of starts to kind of, you know, fill my head with ideas and then, you know, voila. Another thing that I forgot to mention um, as far as priorities with working on stuff um, is because I don't really draw very well. Most of, I mean, I'll do inks and I'll do colors. But most of the stuff that, um, and I, I do inks the old school way with a pen and a piece of paper. Same. Yeah. Um, but uh, but because of that, I, I uh, a lot of what I work on next is dependent upon, you know, what my artists are doing. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what, when I'm, who, how quick somebody is and what I can expect on. Right. So um, right now there are artists that are, that are helping me with forces. Um that story is already written. Um, it's not all dialogue, but it's already written out. All the pencil art is done for it. So um, when I were go to work the dialogue and, and letter the page is when I get one, right? So um, then I have something in front of me. And uh, um, while I'm, when I'm working on, um, I'm working on a, a, a 
an expositioner uh, story, um, like a little a short one. I've got an, a different artist that really wanted to work on a, like a short story. Um, and I've got that one plotted, but it's not written yet because that artist is wrapped up with a different project. So he's not going to be ready for several months. So I'll do the, the, the plot outline on that sometime later. Um, I've got uh, uh, a story that's in the works called uh, The Strange Wanderings of Gilboy Henderson. It's an, a, a, a multi-issue series that I'm working on. Um, the first issue is completely scripted and the pencil art is done and it's at the inkers right now. Um, but I don't know when, how long it's going to take him to work on it because he has other stuff going on. And so uh, I'm not going to sweat getting the second issue out um, written yet. Uh, even though it's plotted, because I don't want to worry. I mean, that's that's down the list, because we've got to get the first issue inked, colored, lettered, and see if anyone even wants to buy it before I'm going to start writing the second one. You know, um, so so that's a that's a big factor for me is you know what do we have for demand um, on all that kind of stuff. So and what needs done to keep people that really are that are because I've got some artists that I work with that are. I'm working on on a, a profit sharing model. So it's like, well, once we sell it, then we can go ahead and get everybody money. But I can't sell it until you have it done. Because <laughs> so, I'm not repeating the uh, mistakes I made from last summer. It's not happening again. Oh, oh that sounds like an interesting story. Oh, we just crowdfunded a, a, a comic and the art team is not finished. And we were supposed to ship in December. So Oh, that... Yeah, it was the thing we were getting out at the beginning of the uh, the show. I was like, where's my comic? Yeah, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> that, but, that that's the story of like comics like forever. You know, where's, dude, where's my comic? Yeah. <laughs> like, and that's yeah. that's mainstream industry too. Yeah, like, well, I mean, and part of part of that is like it's like I was I was um you guys all know um Denny O'Neill. Right, yeah. the group editor of DC of Batman. He was a, a mover and shaker in the '70s and '80s, and he passed away a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, uh, Denny meant a lot to me uh, as a fan. Um, he was um, a, a good writer and a phenomenal editor, and he hired the best people. Right. Um. So for me, when he. Uh, uh, and it's taken me a while. I, I haven't put a lot um, out about it just because it's, it's 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 weird having an emotional reaction to somebody who you've never met, right? I think that's yeah. and a lot of people every time a celebrity dies or some rock musician dies, they get really moony about it. And I'm just like, man, you didn't really know him, and I didn't really know Denny, um, but uh, you know, uh, he is directly and indirectly responsible for uh, a lot of the things that have of the choices I made in my life um, um, because of the comics that he, that he uh, worked on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, this week I, uh, I, I ran across the post and Kelly Jones, who was a, a Batman art a, a artist in the nineties. Um, and uh, he talked about his experience working for Denny O'Neill mm -hmm. and how Denny just believed in um, the people he worked with. Right. But he said that the reason he hired people is because they weren't going to let him down because monthly comics, yep. you know, it, you have you can't miss as an artist. You can't miss your deadlines because you you hang everybody out to dry if you miss your deadlines. And uh, when you're working in a collaboration, it's not your name on the line. It's it's you know, it's it, it's, everyone. it's everyone's name on the line. And you can't you can't flake out on, on the people you work with. It's not cool. And that got me thinking about this whole thing. And, and I think that some of us in the amateur uh, field, um, I don't want to say got into comics because we were annoyed with the sort of laxness that goes on. Because, um, I mean, I was I was making comics, you know, we're doing stuff on the web way back in the day. It wasn't because I was annoyed at 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 Marvel. I wanted to make comics. And, I you know, it wasn't because I was annoyed because I wasn't getting... I was getting treated X and Y by current writers, but I think there are some people that got into it be just because, um, you know, you think you can do better. Well, yeah, I think I can do better. Watch me. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but I think we also like, 
think a lot of indie creators undersell the importance of you know that customer service means going the extra mile and um because our lives are complex but it's uh it's a service industry clean way around is what i'm saying right um we, we serve i think we serve customers by pre presenting products um we uh we uh serve um the the stories by being honest with them and, and working hard at them we serve uh you know truth by being honest with our stories you know and uh, i think it's a service industry clean way around that and a critical blast i know man yeah i believe me. he's said uh i was almost over that about denny i just um yeah that's it's a it's a heavy thing i just can't well there's a, a term in psychology for it. uh you developed a parasocial relationship yeah and uh it just um my probably my f favorite second favorite i don't know how do you gauge that writer um chuck dixon um was talking about on his podcast and just about how um what it meant to work for a uh, a pro who was just who was all about the story and everything else was um you know the personal politics didn't matter as the story was good and your relationships didn't matter as long as you 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 know you were doing the thing to to, to give honor to those characters to give honor to those fans and to give honor to that legacy and that's just that's heavy stuff man i mean uh that's heavy stuff so uh and it's a it's to me it's a shame that um more people don't understand what that means um, on a thing so but anyway i'm mooning on about stuff um i actually don't um it's it's getting close to 10 to the hour so um are there stuff that you go people want i know we've talked about our pro on projects a little bit but is there anything you specifically want people to know about coming up here twitless um oh you put me on the spot yes i did <laughs> um well i'm getting some feedback am i coming through someone else's mic not that i know about i'm not okay here. Gotcha. Okay. For a second, I thought I was hearing feedback. It's always weird uh, for me to hear my, my own voice. I hate my, I hate the way I sound, <laughs> but uh, no. Um, so uh, slight delay, I think on, uh, on our Friday strip, but we uh, check out superschool.com uh, schooled with a K. Uh, and uh, we're starting our new, a new uh, chapter. It's in our ongoing twice a week uh, superhero gag strip about a superhero in a, a super villain high school and all the hijinks they get into where um, the new chapter we're focusing on is all a whole bunch of our side characters. So um, half of the fun is I just uh, make up characters on the spot and I make Taylor draw them. So since we have a whole like basket of deplorables there, we're just going to, you know, pull some at random and see who, what fun we can have and make our main characters into the background characters for once. So we're doing that. Um, I am currently in the process of self-funding the adventures of Omega girl, which is a classic throwback to uh, kind of a, the fun that uh, we've all had in superhero comics. Um, personally, stuff like a, a Justice Society, JSA by Jeff Johns. Big influence, I think, for me. Um, so um, I've, just, I've just got some new art uh, even today, um, going over some of that. So um, I'd like to say that uh, this summer I should have a full issue um, delivered. Uh, but uh, we'll, you know, I'm not making any promises until I can, you know, be more certain of when I can meet those deadlines. So it's work in progress. Paula, what you what do you have going on in the future? Well, currently I still have indigen.xyz going on. Um, it's in it's in demand on Indiegogo. Um, and tell us a little bit about that people that might not know about it. Oh, yes. So I can do the screen share thing again. Do it. That, that'll help me out. So this is, this is my brainchild. This is what I'm doing here. 
Uh, this is my website that's a virtual convention. It's ongoing. It's permanent. I'll be doing this the rest of my life. Uh, what we're going to do is each of us gets a booth that is sort of that's sorted by medium, say, comics. And you can find it. And then each booth, you can see all the categories that you can search it by. This is uh, all the genres. I know Artist Alley is not a genre, but that's that uh, worked better. And when you scroll over it, uh, you get the pitch. And you can click straight through and get to the author or creator site. And this is for independent entertainment. Um, it's like the Amazon search engine, if, it, if they weren't so intent on breaking it all the time. And, you know, you can link to just wherever your work sold, even if it is Amazon. Um, of course, it's better for you if it's your own site. Um, so I want to, uh, I want to get everybody in here. Oh, yeah, I, I would love to get all sorts, all sorts of comic creators, uh, YouTube channels. Yeah, I'd seen you know, that whatever's Wicked had entertain, a booth. whatever's seen, entertainment. Yeah, I'd seen that Wicked had a booth last time I was checking it out, but I'm really glad to see that 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 the Rags team is up there, Sporkman's up there. Those guys. Yeah, and I, I need more. I need yeah. more comics. Yes. A place I'm not already at. You're tempting me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I, I told, I told uh, Paul, I really want on, but our website isn't ready for people to like. I don't want to point people to it because it's just <laughs> ugly right now. So it's got You're a good perfectionist, book, man. Not anything on them. <laughs> I'll let people come in and see my ugliness. I have no shame. <laughs> there you go. So look, I have one. Tabletop Gaming Company. I need more. I'm like Ariel, I need more. <laughs> cool, I'll check it out. All right. Go. So if you go to indiegen.xyz, uh, you'll go to the home page. This is very simple. I have uh, I have a link to an application form which you know it's free to sign up i just need to i just need to know what your tags are and you know your name that you're doing business under and all your you know relevant information so that you can have a really good booth that will be audience facing because our our problem now is we get stuck in these little creator bubbles on twitter or on facebook mm -hmm. or wherever we're not facing the audience. We're facing other creators and talking shop. And we're, it's just really difficult to just switch gears and pitch your book. Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing isn't facing the audience most of the time. But this whole site is for just normal people. They come to this site and they get the whole, um, they get whatever range that they want to look for in whatever media and whatever genre got a bunch here now um, you can also search according to keywords uh, maturity rating uh, state if you want to support locals and uh, there's also a star rating but there's it's uh, not really built up enough to where that matters much right now. <laughs> Everybody's five stars. It's amazing. Uh -huh. Stars! Like sprinkles. But not like glitter, because glitter is the devil. <laughs> you sound like the mother of small children. Uh, they, they have been small in the past, yes. <laughs> now, yeah, now Miss Chaos is ten. You know what she's into now? Slime. Ooh. Which That's sometimes awesome. does involve glitter. Strangely. You thought you cleaned it up a week ago and yet you're still finding some. 
Yeah. It's okay. The cat will eat it. <laughs> That'll be your <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'm trying not to kill you, man. Uh, Stay with well, it. No, as 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 I am still alive. To to throw back to that. Yeah, so you should be stellar. I'm I'm great. I'm great. I'm five stars. That's how it is. <laughs> Uh, metal. What are you working on these days? Uh, well, like I said, I'm working on that manga for the uh, Tezuka manga contest, um, and it is available. People can read it. It's. I don't know if I actually put 27 on there. I may have to go and double check to make sure I'm not behind, but there should be like 27 out of 55 pages of that comic on my site. It should be the first post. You go to xdynamischaos.com, and I got a lot of stuff there. You know, you could. There's the web comic. You can catch up where. It says episode five, but that's because there's an intermission uh, chapter every, after every third one. So it's actually the sixth chapter of the comic. Halfway through that, so there's plenty to catch up. I got some shorts. I got some uh, prose that can be read. And anybody who wants to own physical versions of anything, they can just go and buy it. I have a shop page. It doesn't actually let you buy anything there, but it'll send you the links to places where you can buy it because I don't have the money to print this stuff myself. All of it's like uh, POD. Um, but like, even if, if you're enjoying the story and you don't like the fact that it's on hiatus and you want to get past chapter six, the entire first act, which is like 16 chapters, is novelized. You could just read it if you're impatient. It's there. Oh, not to interrupt, but I got to go. But thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. Nice I hope you stop by Andy Gen XYZ. Yes, and I, 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 I want people to know about that because it's such a wonderful idea. So, all right, thank you so much. Good to meet yeah. you. Have Thanks a good one. Hi, uh, you too. Good night. Bye. Yeah. Oh, te Neo Star asked about it. Yeah, just DM me. I'll, I'll send you the links to everything instead yeah. of going on a long spiel about it here. And uh, there was one other thing. My podcast, The Vomitorium, has been running for like a month now. So. On Saturdays and Wednesdays at two central in the afternoon or evening, whatever you want to call it, you can just come over to the Vomitorium. It's a three-hour show, so like a full radio program. Uh, we actually let callers in; people would hop in the Discord and stuff like that. It's a fun little program, and you can find it on YouTube, Twitch, uh, D Live. And the audio version on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Good gravy, man. That's yeah, dude, I tell you, I'm everywhere. Everywhere. Goodness sakes. Well, Fly Fox, what are you what are you working on these days? What do you want to let people know about? Uh, I'm drawing this concept right here. For nice. A of mine. For a friend of mine, you may know him. Uh, but... Yeah, I, I'm working on a lot of stuff. I have a, a webtoon called Peter the Problematic Person. It's about halfway done, and I need, it's like a, a gag sort of thing, but there's an ongoing little story being told, and that's that's fun. I'm always drawn and doing stuff on my channel, Fly Fox Pro. I also have a gaming channel involved, and I haven't done much with it in a while, but we used to do a podcast. It's called Coin A Geek, so if people are interested in that. Yeah. Cool, cool. And you've got a, a sci-fi project you've got in the background working on stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah. that's uh, Stephen Starlight. He's sort of a, a, go ahead. a Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers type hero, and he's uh, he's my current jam. I've got a ten-page comic I'm making, and get some feedback from some buddies, and then I'll be doing a second pass on the script tomorrow. So. Um, then once that's done, I'll finish up the thumbnails and hopefully get some pages done so I can start promoting it. Get, nice. Get it out there. Yeah. I, and I tell you, I just, that, that, uh, that, uh, 1930s pulp action space stuff. Just, I mean, there's not enough of that out there. No, there's, it's a great genre. It's, uh, it's always, it's always fun and I'm excited to do it. This is actually, when I was talking earlier about the, the stuff that's in the world as a fictional thing. This is, this is that character. He doesn't really fit into that comic book world, but I wanted him to be associated with it. And so he's 
a, a story within that world and he inspires some of the other characters. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. There's a, that's that's intriguing. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I like it. So, um, I'm I'm busy with forces of good and evil. Uh, we are, uh, like I said, um, you could check out. Hey, look, it's a URL banner. Um, and uh, we I'll be up putting up another page tomorrow. Um, for Panic at the Ren Fair, which is our hero students are away at a Ren Fair in Michigan, in the UP for extra credit uh, to uh, um, advance their placement toward the Sidekick Apprentice program and uh, let's see how that all works. Um, <clears throat> but with it, um, that, that'll be wrap up. We, won't wrap, we will wrap up that story by the end of the summer um, and uh, then forces will go on hold for a little while while I'm working on some other projects, uh, including I've Been to Hell, which is story of a it's it's a spin-off of forces where chad the hero greg the villain and their friend demon priest go to visit demon priest's family in hell for spring break and uh uh it's a it's a it's a a, a horror adventure comedy kind of a thing surprisingly it's one of my top three destinations for spring break yeah you would be surprised <laughs> um and that's actually a real fun story. I'm super, uh, in fact, the pencils are already in on that. Um, that's one I was talking about. My anchor has homework to do. Um, and uh, so that'll be, hopefully, we'll get that. Um, I was hoping to have that all done this summer, but it's probably looking to be um, January um, on that one. And we're going to um, gonna be spreading that around once we get some, some stuff on that. So I'm just really stoked for it. Um, uh, and of course, for those of you who are watching, if you want to uh, support us, speed the process along a little, or see um, pages as they're being done, you can check us out on Patreon, um, Patreon front slash ideal underscore comics, and uh, you know buy into the dream. Um, and we'll have some other stuff that we'll be we'll be talking about um, coming up here too. Um, also, for those of you who are backers of um, Expositioner, um, Sola Voce, um, the book we ran last summer, um, we will be having more updates in the next two weeks. We'll know news one way or another. Well, I can't even talk about it yet, man. It's all in the air. <laughs> so, but um, stuff is happening. I will say that much. Um but yeah, so that's where things are at at the minute. Um, but yeah, it's after nine. We've been on for two hours. I want to thank all of my guests. Um, Metal, a Twitless, Fly Fox Pro, um, Paula, and um, Cody who left. Um, this has been a fun conversation. And, hey, thanks for having us. And it's yeah. not just an excuse to talk about my universe, although mine is better than yours. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> thank you for tuning in. Next week's topic is... Were comics always blank? And um, it was partly suggested by one of our one of our, our viewers, um, uh, some of our semi regulars, uh, who asked me, "Were comics always a, a mean girls club?" And um, we're going to be addressing that and other topics. Um, I'm not sure who our panel is going to be yet. I'm um, sure the answer is more nuanced than people expect. Yeah, but I, I do. Uh, I expect Doug Ernst to possibly be one of the guests. Um, but we'll see how that pans out. Um, but yeah, so we're comics always blank. And then we will find out all kinds of things about that next week. Um, but thanks for tuning in and uh, have a great week and uh, check, keep loving comics, people. That's that's what this show is really all about. Yep. Later, guys. Yep, Zan.